Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is the presidency. Joining us is our colleague Jean Healy, vice president of the Cato Institute and author of Cult of the Presidency and False Idol. Gene, as I was prepping for today's episode, I looked back at Article 2 of the Constitution, which describes the executive branch. And I was struck, as I always am when I look at it, at just how short it is. There's, there's really not much to it. Uh, so I was wondering, could you maybe start by telling us what the Constitution says the president is supposed to be up to and then maybe how we got to where we are today? It's interesting. Some of the unitary executive – Advocates argue that the very brevity of Article Two uh, speaks to the vast powers that the president has. And by unitary executive, you mean people who think that the executive is essentially a king, almost, or well, at least imbued at with one an, at one extreme. I mean, narrowly, without getting too far into this, uh, narrowly stated, the proposition for unitary executive theory is that the president has the executive power. The whole thing is uh, Justice Alito put it once and that doesn't require that you uh, – any particular interpretation of the executive power. Uh, it means at a minimum that you – if you're a unitary executive theorist, you think the president can fire his secretary of state without going to the Senate for approval. Um, it doesn't necessarily commit you to – the view that uh, because the president can fire his secretary of state, he can therefore also wake up one morning and decide that uh, we're going to war with Russia over the Crimea, mm. uh, Congress be damned. Uh, so – but but at the extreme of that, a unitary executive theory uh, in recent years has become uh, associated rightly or wrongly with uh, some advocates who take a much broader view of the executive power, particularly in the air, the ever-expanding area of national security. Uh, but I think at its essence in Article 2, uh, the uh, president does have the executive power and the executive power is principally the power to execute the laws. Uh, I, it's not an accident that uh, Article 1 contains most of the important powers uh, and uh, Article 1 contains Congress's powers. It's also not an accident that uh, Congress has more power formally, whether they choose to exercise it or not, over the uh, over the executive than vice versa. Congress can remove the executive. Uh, it doesn't work the other way. Uh, Congress can uh, – you know that there's a uh, – the old law professor uh, Charles Black used to say – that he told his classes uh, that Congress could uh, you know, defund the White House and uh, reduce the president's staff to one secretary for answering correspondence. And he said his students thought he was joking, but Congress under its formal powers actually can do that. Uh, most, of the pow- most of the important powers in government are in Article I and the federal government are in Article I and they're given to Congress. And it's for that reason that actually – uh, per, perhaps uh, not in their mo- not in his most prescient moment that uh, Madison and and others among the framers thought that in uh, a Republican government the legislative branch was the most to be feared. They were actually concerned at the uh, convention, uh, some of them, with providing the president with means for protection so that he would not necessarily get swallowed up in this vortex. Uh, interesting. So that seems to also tie in with the George Washington status too possibly, um, which I think is always interesting when they're writing Article 2. They're also – they have George Washington in the room with them and everyone in the room knows that he's going to be president first. So that seemed to probably influence maybe how they wrote the article and everything about the president's powers. Yeah, I think Washington was viewed as someone who could be trusted with power uh, in part because of the model of power – uh, he embodied was quite different than modern presidents. Uh, he's a man who uh, – the man who would not be king in the, the famous phrase uh, that he exhibited uh, in the legend Cincinnatus-like virtues of self-denial of power. 
Um, and I think that did go into uh, how the executive was viewed. But if we look at the the next presidents, that we start immediately having these conversations about kings, uh, even at the end of Washington's term, and then John Adams' term was constantly he was constantly attacked for wanting to imbue the president with too much nobility and trying to take too much power. Uh, but it keeps growing and growing in this conversation of how powerful the executive is going to be. You know, there are these kingmakers and these non-kingmakers. It's, it's just sort of a motif we have from the very beginning. Yeah, there's a, some debate among presidential scholars, political scientists who study the presidency around this concept of what they call the modern presidency, uh, this presidency that's a plebiscitary figure that draws power from uh, being viewed as the one – legitimate representative of the whole people, a tribune of the people, a uh, president with broad unilateral powers uh, in foreign affairs and even domestic affairs. And the debate is, uh, is there such a thing as a modern presidency? Because you can see at least the seeds of what we know and don't necessarily love in the modern presidency. In early presidents, you have a uh, Andrew Jackson making the claim that the president uh, is the people's tribune in essence. You have uh, James K. Polk showing that the separation of command of the army and the power to authorize war, uh, that the president's command of the army could uh, on occasion make Congress's power to declare war uh, something of an afterthought simply by uh, launch, sending troops into disputed territory and providing occasion, making a war a fait accompli. And, uh, you know, of course, you have Lincoln who uh, exercised uh, executive powers during the Civil War that uh, are at least as broad as uh, virtually anything we, we've seen before or since. Uh, but after Lincoln, you do see a uh, uh, return or congressional resurgence and a return to um, a congressionally dominated government with fairly anonymous presidents. Uh, so I do think there is a transition in the 20th century uh, largely inspired by prog progressive ideology that uh, makes the presidency something quite different than it was through most of the early constitutional period and most of the 19th century. Is this growth in presidential power during the 20th century a result of the president taking on more power himself or is it more a result of Congress abdicating power to the presidency or both? I mean I guess I'm asking is this – has the president as an office done this for and to himself or has it been – has Congress been kind of leading the charge to offer up its power to someone else? It's both. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who popularized the uh, the term the imperial presidency uh, in his uh, 1970, 71 book, that name, he uh, says that you know it was often as often a case of congressional abdication as it was pow of power hungry presidents, and part of that I think is uh, something that. Uh, may be inherent to the constitutional design, an unintended consequence, which is uh, Madison and others among the framers thought that each branch – that ambition would counteract ambition and that each branch uh, would have sufficient incentive to fight for its own territory, that the uh, interests of the man would be aligned with the constitutional rights of the place. And particularly in the 20th century, you see sort of misaligned incentives because there's this phrase commonly you know you hear over and over again no, that nobody wants to leave the presidency you know weaker than they found it, and they generally don't. Uh, presidents have every incentive to fight for an expansion of their powers, whereas very few elections turn on. Uh, the voters punishing congressmen for abdicating constitutional responsibility. I mean you can I, – I think it probably hurt uh, John Edwards, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, and a few others in uh, Democratic primaries uh, in 2007, 2008 that they had uh, 
delegated the power to uh, to launch a war in Iraq to George W. Bush. But in general, you know, most congressmen get reelected, and it's very rare that uh, voters actually punish somebody for punting the question of war or, and peace to to a president. Uh, the incentive for individual congressmen, in fact, is often to to duck that question, uh, whereas the incentive for presidents is to harness, amass, and uh, increase their power. And so you've you've called this the cult of the presidency in in your book. Uh, which sort of came out at a time when presidential power seemed to be most criticized almost at least by the John Stewarts of the world. And then we get Barack Obama, uh, which just continues that forward. But can you describe a little about what, what the term cult of the presidency means as you use it? Well, it's an umbrella term. It's a sort of shorthand for how Americans view the office, this combination supreme warlord of the earth and uh, national nanny. And one of the points of the book is the the, uh, the old Pogo principle, we've met the enemy and he is us. You can blame power-hungry presidents. You can blame uh, feckless congresses. But ultimately, uh, I think the ordinary voter uh, and particularly the, the intellectual elites – bear a large share of responsibility, the lion's share of responsibility for what the presidency has become because the ordinary voter and uh, the you know, uh, pundits and scholars look to the presidency, look to the office of the presidency to achieve things it was never designed to achieve. They invest the office with a, a vast array of responsibilities. The president – is responsible for uh, teaching the children well, uh, saving us from hurricanes, stopping oil spills in the Gulf, um, stopping school shootings, uh, and even for uh, you know if there's a general sense of malaise in the land, uh, the the president is somehow responsible for the tenor of the national spirit. And when you invest a, a when, when you expect a person. Uh, or an office to to deliver on that kind of responsibility, uh, one thing that's natural is that uh, confronted with that vast job description, presidents are going to seek power to try to meet that. And I think that is one of the reasons that the – that dynamic is the fundamental reason why the office has drifted so far from the comparatively mo- modest vision of the presidency that animated the framers. Is it perhaps – was it perhaps too much for the framers to hope for that we could have a president without an associated cult? I suppose in the sense that – I mean you look back at the scope of human history is charismatic leaders and people flocking to them. So it's been it's been kings and popes and various – I mean just celebrity culture is – Vince Lombardi. Yeah. yeah I mean we, we tend to – Find people who we then invest with great importance, and then turn over. You know, they're the ones who are going to solve. I mean, monotheism is an instance of this as well. Um, that that this is just there was no way we could have any amount of power focused in a single person. Whereas Congress is hundreds of people, the the Supreme Court is is nine people. Um, but you put a single person up there, we're just going to direct all of these hopes and dreams and aspirations at that person? That may be the case. I'm reading a, a you know, and maybe the uh, decision against a plural executive uh, at the Philadelphia Convention had a lot to do with this. I'm reading a very interesting book right now called The Once and Future King by uh, Frank Buckley at uh, over at George Mason. Um, and he makes the case – for a parliamentary system, not that uh, you know, he recognizes we're not about to shift gears and adopt one, but uh, by close study of uh, Britain and Canada in particular in their constitutional history, he makes a fairly persuasive case that whatever our natural tendency to invest quasi-spiritual longings in a governmental figure, the specific form of the presidency and the separation of powers makes that tendency worse, uh, that parliamentary 
systems by separating the roles of head and state and head of government uh, sort of fights against this uh, this uh, this tendency that you know no one in Britain uh, you know ever looked to to Gordon Brown or David Cameron for the state of the national soul uh, and that uh, you know that they, they invested these uh, Nation, these longings for national identity on a fairly ha- harmless monarch, uh, and uh, so I, I think there, there's something to be said for that. And Buckley also draws it out with attention to uh, presidential systems in general, which have been. Uh, I think the political science on this is pretty clear at this point. Uh, presidential systems controlling for everything else. Uh, are particularly bad for developing countries. Uh, there's a the scholar Juan Linz who died last year uh, started making that case uh, uh, with the article in a book, uh, the the perils of presidentialism. That uh, developing countries that adopt uh, that had adopted an American style system uh, do uh, have, have far more unstable governments that they, in in many cases and. Uh, are more likely to drift away from a democratic form of government uh, than countries that adopt parliamentary regimes. And uh, that we may enjoy the level of individual liberty and uh, representative government that we have in spite of our presidential system and in part because of our great wealth and our uh, Anglo-American traditions – uh, but that the presidential system we've adopted adopted is not something that seems to be helping. Yeah, and I've made that point before too. That something to just sort of channel people's uh, spiritual longings away from a guy who is megalomaniacal enough to want this job. Uh, almost this weird thing. There's something about hereditary mo- monarchy that's powerless. That it has some something to commend it. I would say, which is a different question of. Uh, the kind of people who want the job becomes the next question because after you make more and more power goes to it and you believe that you control the national conscience, well, then it seems like you're choosing some of the worst megalomaniacal people to even want this job in the first place. Yes, yeah, supposedly uh, Alan Greenspan uh, said something in his uh, memoirs from a couple of years ago that uh, something to the effect of uh, – I've only pro- ever proposed one constitutional amendment and I'm quite serious about it that anyone who wants the job should be forever barred from uh, seeking office. Uh, I think he said that of all the presidents he, he knew, Gerald Ford, who kind of stumbled into it, uh, was the one who seemed most well-adjusted and insane. Um, the presidential selection system has changed uh, quite a bit also over the 20th century in ways that have also had unintended consequences and uh, consequences that I think make it increasingly less likely that a Cincinnatus type self-denying figure will seek the office. Uh, you have uh, you know, a push toward uh, – the primary process, the uh, uh, relative uh, decline of the importance of uh, the smoke-filled room and political conventions and uh, public democratic contests for who becomes the major party standard bearer. And uh, while the – I think the uh, principles animating that shift were uh, fairly – they seem fairly innocuous ones and even laudable ones. The effect is that more so than ever before, uh, to become president, you have to uh, announce uh, at least two years before Iowa uh, and you are going to spend that time uh, raising raising money, uh, traveling throughout uh, uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, other places, uh, spending your time on the road and uh, uh, increasingly – shielding any of your authentic opinions to the extent that you actually have them after a life in politics uh, from any uh, – you know, for, from from public uh, exposure. And whatever this process selects for, it doesn't really select for 
intelligent, public-spirited uh, people who want to, for example, reduce the powers of the presidency. If you're going to run this gauntlet, if you are going to do what it takes to grab that ring, uh, one of the last things I think you would – that system would select for is somebody who – goes through that process, does what it takes and says, OK, now that I'm here, uh, I think I should have a lot less power. Yeah, and I think that also the, the cost it puts on your family is – that's the one that always gets me. Your kids will never be able to live like a normal life. They will not have a normal childhood. They will go to places with secret service all the time uh, and you think that this is all worth it so you might have a chance to direct the national – Spirit, so you can save America. That just is bizarre. That's a good point. Uh, the uh, and uh, you know it's one that you know at least our last two presidents uh, had uh, fairly young kids. Uh, you know your first date is going to be with a Secret Service man in the in the background. Uh, you're going to see John Stewart uh, make fun of your your dad uh, on TV, and uh, you know you you have to worry about your 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 father. Getting shot, uh, it's not something I'd want to put my kids through and uh, I think it, it, it is pretty unusual. Uh, I, I, so so I, I do think increasingly the system selects for the kind of people that you don't that, want, that you don't want <laughs> having nuclear weapons. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that's always struck me as interesting about that and about this notion that you know we get these people who we don't want is that given given the two parties that we have in this country and the fact that it's we have a very partisan political system everyone seems to agree with that about half the time they they always you know if if the other if the if I'm a democrat and the republican wins then we've gotten someone we don't want and it's terrible if he's got all these powers and if I'm a republican and a democrat wins I feel the same way but <clears throat> and then you couple that with the fact that presidents even if if my guy my party's guy gets elected I tend to be super enthusiastic when he's first elected and then by the end of his second term, he's a bum. He's just – he's failed all the things that I hoped for. But we never seem to learn our lesson. We never say like, well, yeah, my guy might get elected but the other guy might too so I don't want to give him that much power or I've gotten burned by the last three members of my own party to achieve the office but this next one, he's going to be the one. That's and the it one. Just, it seems very, very weird. There's the – myopia of not being able to, to think past the next election cycle. That was nicely illustrated in a, a 2012 video that I think it was uh, Gawker put together going around the Democratic National Convention and uh, asking prominent Democratic figures, I think including Harry Reid. Uh, so do, do we think that Mitt Romney can be uh, – Trusted with the uh, governmental kill list uh, <laughs> and watching their, their you know, it's like they they'd never thought of that. Uh, so so there is that, and there yeah, it, it is perplexing that this uh, perennial cycle of uh, you know exuberance and deep disappointment doesn't stop people from falling in love with the romance of the presidency every four to eight years over again, depending on. You know which side of the political aisle you're on. Uh, you'd think after a while, people would be able to have a, a bit of a longer attention span and realize that uh, this process is not ever going to guarantee anything other than perennial disappointment and the accumulation of state power. And in your addendum to cult of the presidency or sequel or however we want to call it, uh, false idol, because we really saw that I think in Barack Obama uh, in the level that at least in my lifetime I haven't seen and maybe in, in a long time, this absolute fervor for a man and then increasing disappointment. Yeah, I was in I was in law school when – in Denver when um, Obama was first running for president and the, the convention, the Democratic convention was in Denver and the – the way that my law professors and many of my fellow students spoke about him and they would they had their badges that would get them into the convention and we all class got out early so everyone could go to this thing and they'd hold it up and there was just this this kind of combination of you were going to witness you know something like your you know the return of the beatles or something like that plus 
the way that people talk about the second coming or you know that that scene in the movie Independence Day when the people are on the roof of the building completely overcome with joy that the aliens are coming like it was this just outpouring of optimistic emotions in a very unseemly yeah i saw fashion. Three, three people crying yeah. um and it was just i mean it was it was weird and off-putting so where are we now in that sure. story here, here in uh in downtown dc chinatown where i was it was like uh you know the yanks had just liberated paris uh uh where are we now in that uh, in cycle? This, yeah, in the cycle well we're in the uh uh, far past the post honeymoon, uh, you, you know, it's a, you have uh, schizophrenia on both sides of the the aisle. Um, so the on the right you have uh, the, the presidency becomes such a focal point of uh, all American hopes and dreams. Uh, you know, I say in the uh, false idol, the ebook that. Uh, when Obama said, "I'm like a Rorschach blot," uh, he was he, he was more accurate than he knew, and especially uh, having taken the presidency, you know, people see in this figure what they you know what they what they want to see. On the right, you have uh, people who uh, are who were initially convinced that this was the second coming of, uh, in a bad way, of LBJ and FDR. Uh, you have uh, these theories that Obama, uh, you know, at, uh, tutored by uh, Saul Alinsky or Bill Ayers or, or whoever, has been engaged in a long-running plan, a uh, perfectly executed scheme to destroy the American way of life. And at the same time and sometimes even in the same breath, you see otherwise intelligent figures on the right uh, say that uh, the man's total incompetent who, uh, you know, took power when he barely knew where to find the stapler in the Senate office and uh, you know he, he's he, he he's engaged in a decades long conspiracy to destroy the American way of life and he uh, he's really not doing a good job uh, <laughs> so it, that's on the right on the left uh, you you went through this uh, initial uh, Beatlemania phase uh, where uh, you know, everything was going to be ter terrific. The ocean's rise would stop and uh, we'd find a cure for cancer in our time and uh, uh, fundamentally transform the U.S. economy and so on and so forth to the – this really this sense of disgust and betrayal in some quarters that the president is just not tough enough uh, and, uh, you know, ignoring the fact that, uh, you know, for however much – power the presidency has accumulated, the, the still particularly domestically, the the president can't simply like Captain Picard just, you know, make a hand gesture and say make it so and, and fundamentally change uh, American law and life. And everyone who doesn't go along with him is obstructionist. Yeah. 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 He's supposed uh, to lead the whole ship. So. so it makes you wonder why anyone would want this job because presidents tend to end up uh, more or less uh, – they're perennial disappointments uh, and the only thing that's uh, – well, you can probably guarantee two things. Uh, the political scientist Theodore Lowy uh, had one of Lowy's maxims which was uh, every president – contributes to the upgrading of the reputation of his predecessors uh, and that's the only sure contribution that any president will make. So uh, probably an idea reflected in that billboard uh, a while ago in Texas with the big picture of George W. Bush that said, miss me yet? Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, you know, were going through everybody now looking back at uh, H.W. and what a great president he was and uh, – you know Clinton, uh, who, if you read the Wall Street Journal in the 1990s, uh, was uh, running a socialist a, himself, right? Yeah, <laughs> and even in some of the things they ran, running a murder incorporated out of Arkansas was a rapist and uh, uh, the worst crook ever. Uh, and uh, now people look back on him fondly. So I think uh, Heck, one, I, I look back on him fondly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in retrospect, he seems a little bit like Warren G. Harding. He provided a lot of entertainment and. Uh, you know, 
the, 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 there weren't really any great leaps forward in uh, – to speak of in government power uh, during the Clinton years. Uh, the other thing that the presidency uh, in addition to what Lowy said uh, that you can reliably say about each successive president, uh, for the most part, you know, the office, they do leave the office stronger than they found it. And unless you think that the office of the presidency is perpetually too weak, uh, that might not be a good thing. So who are the great presidents then according to popular historic – we're talking about how political scientists view this and also how the public views this. Who, who are the ones that we look back on as great presidents? What, what typifies their administrations? Well, there is you know, the – what – the scholars who participate in these periodic presidential ranking surveys uh, look at as the great presidents and there I think you've got uh, real evidence of perversity among uh, intellectual elites. You have – you know, if you look at the top 10 on uh, – you know, I think it's Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s father uh, who did one of the first of these in the 40s. And you know we have them, uh, you know every few years or so, a bunch of different uh, uh, bodies that do them. The Siena Research Institute, uh, sometimes magazines do them. Uh, Wall Street Journal did one uh, ten years ago, trying to correct for liberal bias, and they're all pretty consistent. Even the Wall Street Journal one that, that tried to have a politically balanced panel of. Uh, presidential scholars and uh, law professors, they all uh, come out uh, mostly the same and the top 10 presidents, you have a disproportionate number of war leaders, uh, crusaders, people who uh, tried to revolutionize the political order in some way and the ones that do very badly are the ones that didn't do much and kind of bored people. Um, and if you think the purpose of the presidency is to entertain presidential scholars, then that might mean something. But uh, I think a perfect illustration of this is that on almost every presidential ranking survey, uh, Woodrow Wilson is in the top 10 and his successor, Warren Harding, is last or, or next to last. Um, and you know Wilson – probably the worst president in American history, uh, took us into a destructive and an unnecessary war, uh, you know, ran roughshod over civil liberties during the course of that war, was a horrible racist who resegregated the federal government. You can go on and on. Warren G. Harding uh, you know, dismantled much of the uh, Wilson wartime economy, uh, is too little recognized as a decent president on civil liberties. He pardoned and commuted sentences of Wilson's political prisoners, people like Eugene Debs who had been put in jail for making – under the Espionage Act for making a speech praising somebody who advocated draft resistance. And uh, – but, you know, Warren G. Harding, he had the Teapot Dome scandal and uh, that uh, – you know, they hold that against him. But it doesn't seem to me that the uh, Teapot Dome scandal uh, – Killed a hundred thousand uh, American doughboys, so maybe they're uh, they, maybe they should re-engineer their rankings. Um, U.S. News a few years ago did a, a, an issue on America's ten worst presidents, and uh, William Henry Harrison uh, made the the bottom ten. He was president for a month. Yeah, he barely did anything but give the longest uh, inaugural address in in uh, presidential history and keel over. Uh, so he he didn't have any opportunity to uh, to, to, to do anything bad. Uh, what you see over and over again is that the, there is no respect for any kind of presidential Hippocratic oath. Any concept that first do no harm might be the uh, the way to go. And you, you you know behind it all you do see uh, quite a bit of contempt for. The idea of peace and prosperity for – you know, in Harding's case, a lot of people sneer at uh, his neologism normalcy, which just stood for uh, 
getting back to a, non, a period of non-emergency, non-crisis government where you can go on and live your life and not be uh, enlisted in grand national crusades. Well, uh, if you look at the presidential rankings, that's a, a, an idea that a lot of scholars hold in deep contempt. Wondering if you could talk a bit about what this all seems related to, um, which is kind of the the culture of power worship that I mean is particularly prevalent in in this town in Washington, um, where there's there's almost a sense that that the powerful are better than the rest of us simply because of their power or or ought to be respected, and that respecting the powerful is is part of being a a good and fulfilled person. Um, I'm, I'm thinking or this week the New York Times columnist David Brooks penned a column and he's penned a lot of columns of this sort. Gene's already laughing just yeah. at the very mention of his name. <laughs> uh, where, where he talked about the importance of, of basically freedom in subservience, that, that living under the powerful and doing what they want is an important part of living a good life. Um, and this seems – I mean this seems obviously – very bound up in what we've been talking about. Yeah, it's a, a, a perennial theme of David Brooks is uh, that uh, he he's distrustful of. Uh, I remember he wrote one a few weeks ago about millennials and their individualistic attitudes. Because uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's close. So they're like, you know, a nation like this is not so easily led, uh, which you would think would you know, not thing. not be a bad thing. Um, uh, there, I, I think you do see some of that. That's reflected in the presidential rankings. That uh, you know the the, the notion that uh, and, and it's certainly David Brooks's uh, uh, work is, is a lot like that. The uh, book on the bourgeois bohemians. Um, there, it, it's a really amusing work of what he calls comic sociology. But there is also a note of. There's something gross about people who you know want slate shower stalls and eat arugula and uh, uh, you know in, enjoy the the simple or not so simple pleasures of life. You saw this uh, after September 11th uh, on left and right. There was a notion that um, you know we we're going to have war and uh, the moral equivalent of war. Uh, there. People that seem to think, you know, the the worst thing that George W. Bush ever said uh, after 9/11 was that um, not that we would rid the world of evil, but that we, you know, people what what Americans should do is, uh, you know, relax, go enjoy America's great destination spots, or go to Disney World. Uh, that was a, a statement of Bush's that was attacked by John McCain, was attacked by Barack Obama, Joe Biden. You name it. Uh, there's uh, this deep background notion that uh, peace and prosperity, living your life and uh, determining your own purposes rather than being led in a uh, – what McCain calls a cause greater than yourself, uh, that, that that's just contemptible. Uh, you know, we can't, uh, we can't decide our own purposes in life. Uh, we need a grand government crusade uh, to to unite us all, and the grandest uh, government crusade of all is war. And uh, I think the growth of presidential power has very much been wrapped up in in war. I think the, you had a, I pulled a quote from False Idol from Chris Matthews, uh, one of the most sycophantic people I know. Uh, this day he was inaugurated with with the mall filled with people, African Americans and everyone else. Obama just sent us all home. Why are we in this fight with him? Just tell us, Commander. Give us our orders and tell us where we're going. Give us a mission. Yeah, I think that pretty much uh, symbolizes that perfectly. Yeah, this uh, I say in the the book that uh, for some reason a lot of this tends to happen on Chris Matthews' show Hardball. Uh, you had uh, Evan Thomas from Newsweek saying, "You know, Obama is floating above all of us. He's going to unite us all. He's sort of, sort of God." Uh, <laughs> yes, I didn't know that. He actually said that. One. Yeah, this seems to be a big problem for us as libertarians, right? Because I mean, no matter how good the policy proposals that we make are, and no matter how much we can show that 
you know, reducing the size of this program would reduce – would lead to better results or increasing choice or, you know, expanding the reach of the market and shrinking the reach of politics would be good. Uh, at a very basic level, our view of good governance and good citizenship is 180 degrees from this, is that there's – that we shouldn't be ruled and and that we shouldn't be told what to do or at the very least, if we're going to be told what to do by people, we shouldn't be told what to do by people who can use guns to back it up. If, if we want to listen to a charismatic leader, that's fine but it ought to be voluntary. And so is this just – I mean this just seems like a fundamentally different way of – of viewing the world. Yeah, I think this is, is similar to something we've talked about. Aaron and I have talked about for years. We, we don't offer any great projects for people to go behind, and, and we don't talk in this rhetoric. And something Aaron and I talked about for years is that West Wing is an example of the show where the guy is always doing this. Right. I've I've argued before that the West Wing, which I quite enjoy as a TV show, I think you and I disagree on that, but I I enjoyed it. Um, would have been. I mean, it needed to have a Mythical leftist presence. president, or I mean, or a, a statist president, so to speak, because if it had had a strictly libertarian president, it would have been an awfully boring show. Every episode, someone would have wandered into his office, said, "Here's a problem," and he would have said, "Nothing I can do about that." What do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, uh, right. There, uh, there isn't anything uh, in the libertarian program that uh, you know you, you're sort of left with a. Uh, the rallying cry is "Get on with your life." You know, that, that's, <laughs> go forth and prosper. Uh, Leave me and, alone. Live your own life together. Uh, yeah, I, I think you know perhaps that is a, a fundamental aspect of human nature that uh, you know libertarianism doesn't quite have a uh, an answer for. Um, I, you know, it does seem to be worse among the intellectuals and what David Brooks calls non-ironically, I think, the thought leaders. Uh, because if you do look at uh, – if you – the public is actually somewhat better on this because if you look at polling data on various presidents, uh, you know, Truman left office uh, deeply unpopular. Uh, a lot of presidents leave. Presidents invariably disappoint. But not all of them leave office totally unpopular. Uh, Reagan left office with uh, above 50 percent approval ratings as did Clinton. Uh, Warren Harding was wildly popular while he, while he was uh, around. Uh, so while presidents are, are in office, it's not as though there's a giant groundswell of uh, people – out there that uh, it's like the old adage about neoconservatives being, uh, you know, a head with no body. Uh, you know, occasionally you can stir up war fever, but in general, if you want to be a successful president, in the terms of, you know, being popular while you're in office, uh, you do better uh, not making a whole lot of trouble. Uh, but these presidents, you know, like Truman, uh, who were wildly, and Wilson, who were wildly unpopular uh, while their grand crusades and uh, failed wars were going on, uh, they tend to get upgraded by historians and in popular memory because we remember that they did something. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if I have an answer to that fundamental problem. I would just say that. Uh, whatever this uh, longing is in human nature, it seems to be uh, more uh, vocally expressed among uh, the people, the scholars who fill out presidential report cards and the pundits who follow the White House than it does uh, among ordinary people. It also might be the case that if you are an intellectual type and you think the rest of the people are benighted in some way and, and – and stupid, it's stupider than you are at least, that you think that's just what people need to pull them out of the darkness is someone to lead them to glory in some way. Yeah, and some of it is, is uh, ordinary boredom, I think. Uh, the, uh, the I quote uh, Fred Barnes uh, after uh, from the Weekly Standard after 9-11 uh, uh, in The Cult of the Presidency where he, he wrote a piece 
early on talking about it was just so boring in the 90s. You know, nothing was going on. We didn't have uh, – you know, we didn't have anyone leading us. We didn't have any wars to fight. And he so looks, the union was gone. What yeah, you so we had nobody to fight and the, the – uh, you know, he, he looks back to you know when he got to Washington uh, during the first Gulf War and how awesome it was and how cool it was to to have this to cover. Well, that's a you know kind of perverse and disgusting attitude, uh, but uh, you know I think it's it's more prevalent than not. I mean, war is a hell of a lot more interesting than uh, the tax code. Yeah, and you get the same thing in World War One buildup, which is of course the most – almost apotheosis of the state leading people to destruction. But so many people sitting around being like, it's been so long since we've had a good European war. Uh, it's been at least since the Napoleonic Wars. You know, It's about time. You've got to join the military, especially for the second born son and somehow achieve glory. And the only way you can do that is on a battlefield. Everyone's itching for war. Even you know, 1910, they're just waiting for what's going to set it off, which is again incredibly perverse. Yeah, it's the – Animating principle of national greatness conservatism. The uh, like Teddy Roosevelt uh, put it: war is a great tonic for the national spirit, and uh, we need these uh, unifying crusades to pull us out of our shabby little lives. Uh, and uh, you know how how you defeat that notion is uh, yeah, that's a tough question. Why does it have to be invested in politics? I mean, why can't we have national greatness through Technological accomplishments through you know we we as a people are going to eradicate hunger via you know entrepreneurship and expanding knowledge. I mean, there are all of these projects. They're all like they're amazing things that have happened so over the course of the last hundred years that have dramatically improved the quality of our lives. But we rally around the things that result in dead bodies and. But it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it has to be that way. It just like it doesn't have to be – it wouldn't have to be the president that we rally around. We could rally around all sorts of different figures. Why, why do we invest it in the political? Well, I suppose because uh, you know, you, it doesn't require anything of us. I mean we could have rallied around Steve Jobs but he sort of would have you – know, he didn't really need your help uh, other than to, to sell you a product. So a lot of the uh, – I think the impulse to do it, you know, the, I, I, I guess the, what what people in favor of this impulse would say is it doesn't uh, it, celebrating human achievement uh, that's you know uh, accomplished through the actions of individuals, inventors, and entrepreneurs doesn't really require anything of us. Uh, you know, I think it would be a better country if uh, like some other countries, instead of having our presidents on our currency, we had uh, you know, people who uh, Thomas, accomplished Thomas something. Thomas Edison. Yeah, yeah people who you know, brought us light. Uh, yeah. and, but you know, I, other than cheering your sports team, which is a far healthier uh, thing than cheering your political party, uh, you know, there's – the libertarians don't have any uh, political way to tap into this impulse. I think one of them would be free writing sense of accomplishment. Uh, there has to be something that's psychologically gratifying, right? So we could say we need to do things together, which when someone says that who's not Barack Obama, I say, yes, we do. Uh, Apple was not done just by Steve Jobs. It was done with a bunch of other people. But also that means that a bunch of other people can't free ride off of Apple's success, right? Uh, they can't feel a sense of accomplishment by having participated in something because they didn't actually participate in it maybe by buying an Apple product. But people can really – get Shareholders, yeah. That's, but every, it's pretty inclusive. It doesn't have a bunch of free riders. But when you start talking about national greatness and people who get like a sense of pride of being an American – uh, they're free riding. If you know, if they haven't done anything that great, they're free riding off of the sense of community that other people achieved. The interesting thing is, modern war doesn't really require much more of us than uh, you know. It's not a so you have a lot of uh, uh, bloggers who uh, seem to think they were uh, you know combat blogging by uh, attacking uh, peaceniks on the internet, uh, but. You know, modern war does not, uh, with a volunteer military, uh, does not really require you to do much more than pay your taxes. Uh, so, it's odd that 
you know, this collectivist impulse is, uh, you know, is viewed as somehow satisfied when we're, it's not like we're going to war on terror bond rallies and saving scrap metal. Um, but yeah. yeah. So where do we, where do we go from here? Where do you see this going? Is there a uh, solution to this process? Or is it just going to get worse? I don't think it's going to get worse. I mean, one of the, well, one of the, the things that, uh, the part of uh, the cult of the presidency that people liked the least was the last chapter when uh, I said – I thought pretty forthrightly that, look, I can give you a five-point plan about how to save this and uh, you know, I'll, I'll go through the motions but it's not going to work. Um, that was the least popular part, part of the book because uh, having proposed the uh, problem, I didn't – give anybody any solutions. Because, because they want to be inspired and led. <laughs> <laughs> well, the solutions are hard and uh, you know, most, of the, uh, most of them run up against the fundamental problem. So uh, you, know, you could propose uh, strengthening the war powers resolution uh, but you've got the problem that uh, you know, the war powers resolution, which has been almost entirely useless and perhaps even pernicious, uh, you know, was only passed in a – unique historic window of opportunity with an embattled President Nixon where you could actually override a presidential veto um, and it's gone on. It hasn't really constrained presidents at all. Uh, Obama became the second president uh, to wage a war beyond the 60-day the, uh, limits. Uh, first was President Clinton but in – most presidents have, have – many presidents have used it in fact to argue that uh, the – the resolution authorizes short, sharp uh, uses of force, which by its plain terms it doesn't. But they use the 60-day limit to say that, well, you know, you said we could use it. Uh, you could just wage war for up to 60 days with a free pass. Um, most statutory uh, restrictions are, are for reasons like that are unequal to the task. Uh, we're not going to – transmute into a parliamentary government and that wouldn't – then even that would not solve uh, most of our problems, I, I don't think. Um, so it's not something that – and I continue to hold out hope that, uh, for example, the Obama presidency would heighten the contradictions that you would have uh, somebody who uh, pumped up expectations for what the presidency could achieve even far beyond what they the, – the irrational heights they'd reached before uh, and then failed spectacularly. You'd think uh, that would maybe condition people to invest less, uh, f invest fewer hopes in the presidency. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not sure that's going to happen either. There are uh, long-term trends though. I mean it's very easy for, for us, uh, particularly as libertarians I think, to, to – say things are always getting worse. Uh, but a longer term view, uh, I think there are some secular trends that are encouraging at least. Um, the And one of my point to is the decline in trust in government. Um, this is something that uh, when these the trust in government numbers come out that they're – uh, in this town, is it's usually recognized as a, a crisis. People don't trust government as much as they used to, uh, and you know this. This is one of the longest running polling questions. It dates to the, uh, I think, the second Eisenhower administration. Um, how much of the time do you trust the government in Washington to do what is right? Uh, most of the time, always. Uh, just about never. Um, and uh, they usually combine the most of the time and just about always answers and that gives you the trust in government index. And when they started taking it in the late Eisenhower, early New Frontier era, you had over 75 percent of Americans saying that they trusted the federal government in Washington to do what is right most of the time or just about always. It was reflected in the popular culture. It was reflected in the culture of journalism, investigative journalism. Uh, did not really exist to the extent that it does today, and uh, you, you know, someone ridiculing the president like uh, John Stewart would probably be arrested like Lenny Bruce in the in the uh, early '60s, or at least would not be would not have a popular platform. Um, you it, and after 
it, they start going down in – the numbers start plummeting uh, when the Vietnam War starts going badly in 66 or thereabouts. Uh, they never recover after Watergate. Uh, they bottom out during the 70s. They spike a little bit after 9-11 but quickly go back to uh, Watergate era levels. Um, now, declining public trust isn't always a good thing. It's not good when you see the numbers say interpersonal trust between Americans uh, is going down and uh, you know there's some relationship between the two. Um, but – you know, scholars who study trust in the trust in government number have correlated it with uh, fewer wars, less tolerance for military ad- adventurism, uh, and even uh, from the domestic side for libertarianism. Uh, there's a scholar named Mark Hetherington who's showed that uh, you know it really means that a new New Deal and a new great society is no longer possible. It's a conclusion that he didn't like uh, being uh, a, a liberal Democrat, but uh, he says this is pretty much, you know, Obamacare barely squeaked uh, to the, the Heritage Healthcare Foundation. The, the, the Heritage, Heritage Healthcare, Healthcare Plan, plan, yeah. plan basically uh, barely got passed. Uh, you're not going to see, uh, he says, uh, a new New Deal, a new great society because the public doesn't trust the federal government enough to allow that. Um, so that's a trend that I think uh, constrains presidents somewhat. Uh, in some ways, given the shock of 9-11 and those horrific images, it's a little bit astounding that uh, we did not see worse abuses than we did. Uh, you know, We shouldn't be happy about the ones we did see, um, but you could you could foresee it in an atmosphere of more trust uh, going even worse. Um, so I take – you know, I, I, I have a grain – I take a grain of optimism from that trend. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at the rever- reverence with which presidents were treated uh, before uh, Watergate, uh, there's a, a passage uh, from the – there's a – Selection of the Watergate tapes where uh, Halderman and Nixon are talking about, um, you know, should we squelch the Pentagon Papers? Should we prove, should we try to keep the Washington Post and the New York Times from releasing this? And Halderman says to Nixon, you know, this is a very bad thing if this gets out. Uh, it you know it means that the implicit infallibility of presidents, which is an accepted thing in America, you know, will no longer be taken for granted. And uh, you know, I say in the book that. You, no one today would talk about the implicit infallibility of presidents. Nobody believes that, and uh, it's a it's a ludicrous idea. But it was something that you could talk about as recently as you know 1972. Uh, that that was a widely accepted thing in America. Um, you know where there's no putting that genie back in the bottle, and that and that's a good thing. So uh, I think another uh, trend uh, will be. Um, the relative decline of uh, American military power uh, that we will not be – we're in no danger of not being the dominant military power on the globe for our lifetimes. But uh, I, I, I think international uh, changes uh, are going to force the United States to behave a little bit more like a, a normal country in international affairs and – since the growth of the imperial presidency coincides with America's rise to world dominance, uh, I think that's going to be a good thing, and I think it will restrain uh, further growth of president, presidential powers somewhat. But you know, as for returning to uh, something like the modest presidency of the Harding and Coolidge years, uh, that does not seem to be in the cards uh, anytime soon. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.